The past five years have seen an increase in anti-Semitic violence around the world. We've seen mass shootings at synagogues, violent attacks on Jewish people in the streets, and Jewish cemeteries desecrated. And while anti-Semitism isn't new, the current social and political landscape has given rise to conspiracy theories and populist leaders who are aiming to exploit anti-Semitic tropes for political gain. What's more, there are dissenting views within the Jewish community on how to actually define anti-Semitism. So what are the best ways to identify and combat anti-Semitism? And how do we separate anti-Jewish rhetoric from criticism of the state of Israel and its policies? That's our discussion in this week's Upfront Special. Joining us to discuss this is Rabbi Brent Rosen, Reconstructionist rabbi and founding member of Jewish Voice for Peace's Rabbinical Council, and Lara Friedman, president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace and contributing writer to Jewish Currents and the American Prospect. I want to thank you both uh, for joining me on Upfront. Uh, in February, two Jewish worshipers were shot while leaving their respective synagogues in Los Angeles. Uh, in recent years, violent anti-Semitic attacks have increased all across the world. Uh, in the past five years, we've seen mass shootings at synagogues in Pennsylvania, uh, California, and Halle, Germany. Uh, Jewish cemeteries from, from Istanbul to Illinois uh, have been desecrated and defaced. Swastikas are painted on Jewish homes. Uh, Rabbi Rosen, you're, you're a Jewish community leader. Are we seeing an emboldening of, of anti-Semitism? Oh, I think there's no question. I think there's no question. I think. We can date it back to the rise of ultranationalist regimes around the world that started to use anti-Semitism for their own political purposes, and that really kind of unlocked it, you know, gradually since then. I think 2018, with the, the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, was a huge Rubicon and, and, and wake-up call for the Jewish community and for the world mm. at large, and I think it's just been progressing since then. Mm -hmm. Lara, uh to your point, m many in the Jewish community say that the past few years have, have felt different. Uh, according to the American Jewish Committee's annual survey, a little over 80% of American Jews say anti-Semitism has worsened in the country uh, in the past five years. And in a 2018 European survey, 90% of European Jews said anti-Semitism is getting worse. Uh, getting reliable data on hate crimes is, is, is often difficult, and there are large gaps when it comes to actually tracking incidents. So, so what do we know? Is anti-Semitism getting worse right now? So I don't think there's any question. I mean, Rabbi Rosen is right. I mean, you, you can tie this to the rise of, of ultranationalism, to white supremacy. We've seen it in the United States with the rise of, of you know, the Trump era and, and MAGA politics. Something has been unleashed. And, and arguably, it's something that was always there. There's a reason why, for, for most, certainly, Jewish Americans, our, our parents, our grandparents, have always warned, you have to keep watching, because anti-Semitism is real, it exists below the surface, and now it's really, it's really coming out, and it seems like it's very much unleashed. And I think the personal experiences of most of us, you know, if you're on social media and you have a Jewish name, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, you're probably getting hate named at you. Really, I mean, for me, it really started being unleashed with the Trump era. Hmm. Um, you know, my last name is Friedman. I'm very clearly and unapologetically Jewish. Um, and the hate is out there, whether I'm, I'm tweeting about re things related to Israel or things related to, you know, local politics or, or whatever. Um, it, it, it's ever present. There's no question the classical sense of what is anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews, threatening of Jews, targeting of Jews because they are Jewish, is surging in the United States and it's surging around the world. Uh, in 2017, there were white supremacists who shouted, Jews will not replace us, while marching with torches in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the kind of overt anti-Semitism that I think you're talking about. Uh, many, however, lean on more coded forms of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. uh, more coded rhetoric, including leaders like former U.S. President Donald mm -hmm. Trump, who repeatedly refuses to disavow neo-Nazis and insists that there were very fine people on mm -hmm. both sides after that rally in Charlottesville. Uh, he also ran a political ad that featured a number of prominent American Jews, including George Soros, the philanthropist, including uh, Janet Yellen, the Federal Reserve Chair, while warning of global special interests that have robbed our working class and stripped our country of its wealth. I mean, the tropes abound there. Uh, Soros was also targeted by the Hungarian prime minister, uh, Viktor Orban, whose government has repeatedly sought to minimize Hungary's role in the Holocaust. Uh, what's the impact of this kind of anti-Semitism, the coded anti-Semitism, on the political and the cultural, cultural mainstream? 
Yeah, and those kinds of dog whistles, you know, those kinds of coded references, they've been around for a long time. They far predated Trump, but particularly in Europe. I think the difference is when, when the president of the United States is doing it um, and tweeting it incessantly, uh, when he brings people into his administration, you know, people like Steve Bannon and Mike Pompeo, uh, that, that raises it up to a whole new level. Uh, but he's been very, Trump ha has always been very expert at sort of treading that line. Uh, that we all know what he's saying, but he always will, you know, take a step back when he needs to. But what it ends up doing is making it, it legitimizes it, it mainstreams it, and it emboldens people who have no, you know, compunction about taking things up to the next level, whether it's through violence um, or whether it's through, you know, popular figures like Kanye West last year. And he's one of the, you know, most popular entertainers in the world. So that has, I think, definitely raised it to, in terms of acceptability, to a whole new level. Hmm. Many anti-Semitic uh, theories are tied up with broader uh, white supremacist beliefs, like Great Replacement uh, theory. Uh, the white supremacist who murdered 11 Jews at the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, he chose that synagogue specifically because it hosted a branch of a refugee support network. Help me understand, uh, and Lara, I'm actually going to start with you. Uh, what is the relationship or the interplay between xenophobia and anti-Semitism? Look, I mean, I think if you go back to th throughout history, um, illiberal forces, ultranationalist forces, ethnic, eth ethnic superiority has always focused on Judaism. Jews have always been a convenient foil, a, a convenient um, weapon to be used in culture wars, political wars in countries. I think what we're seeing today isn't, isn't new in any way. I think it is the modern version of this, and it's on steroids because of social media, because of mm. the way that the, the, the media today deals with truth and not truth. I think what we're seeing today is, is the, you know, the, the current version of what you saw in Europe in our grandparents' era. If you want someone to blame, who do you blame? We're losing our privilege. Who do we blame? We blame the Jews. Who do we blame? We blame the Jews because they're powerful. We blame the Jews because they're taking over. We blame the Jews because they have a different set of values from us, which, by the way, does get into this question of conflation because then you've got the, you know, the, the fetishization of Israel and Judaism by folks who are also anti-Semitic, which is, you know, the Trump loving people and saying they can't be anti-Semitic because they like Israel. I think Lara's point is really well taken. I think, you know, Prejudice is prejudice, and they're all interlocked, uh, and they all have their unique aspects. And I think anti-Semitism has its own unique kind of tropes that have always been around. Uh, and in particular, re replacement theory is something, it's nothing new, as she said. It dates back to the protocols of the elders of Zion. It's rooted in this conspiratorial trope about Jews who are seeking world domination and are using other minorities and other peoples to, as, as kind of pawns in, uh, in, their, in their plans. So, you know, we, I think we need to be clear that, yes, you know, these oppressions, whether it's racism, whether it's Islamophobia, uh, transphobia, LGBTQ phobia, they, they're all interconnected. They all have their unique aspects to them, but ultimately they're under the same umbrella of, of oppression, of systemic oppression of people for mm -hmm. political purposes. Laura, we're at a moment where, where Jewish communities around the world seem to be grappling uh, with Zionism as a concept. Uh, this isn't a new conversation, and yet it feels particularly urgent uh, at this moment. Uh, you've written about the contrast between the definition of anti-Semitism that focuses on hatred of Jews because they are Jews, as you talked about earlier in this conversation, uh, and another definition that encompasses some criticisms and condemnation of the state of Israel and its policies. Now, this newer definition, uh, as Anthony Lerman put it, posits anti-Zionism as, quote, the same bigotry uh, that motivated pogroms and the Holocaust. Uh, what are your thoughts on making anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism synonymous? Look, I mean, there are, you, you, it, it's understandable why we're seeing this effort to conflate anti-Semitism with criticism of Israel and anti-Zionism. We're at a moment in history when um, successive Israeli governments have walked away from even a pretense of wanting peace with the Palestinians, of recognizing Palestinian rights and a self-determination, all of those things that, that gave Israel a lot of cover and gave it some protection for criticism of its actual current day in this moment policies of repression against Palestinians. It doesn't have that cover anymore. 
And by conflating criticism of Israel or criticism of Israeli policies with anti-Semitism, it's a way of avoiding that discussion altogether. There are legitimate reasons to criticize Israel. There are legitimate reasons to criticize or reject Zionism that aren't having anything to do with how you feel about the Jewish people. It, this framing absolutely says, irrelevant, we don't care. It's also, and going back to what we've been talking about so far today, it is morally indefensible. We are in a period of actual rising real anti-Semitism. And to shift the focus and shift the energies that should be focused on fighting anti-Semitism to defending Israel and to making it about quashing criticism of Israel it is, again, it's, 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 it's utterly indefensible. And what we saw in the Trump era, it's not merely that it's indefensible and it, it wastes energy from things that you should be fighting. It actually gives cover to anti-Semites. With President Trump, you had President Trump publicly basically saying, you know, the Jewish, American Jews are insufficiently supportive of their country. They mean, he means Israel. It, it, it is clearly anti-Semitic to, to equate Jews with Israel. And that's part of this definition that I actually agree with. The definition that, that's being promoted, called the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, includes saying you know, holding all Jews responsible for the actions of the state of Israel is anti-Semitism. I agree with that. But under the framework that is being adopted by um, the ultranationalists who are very clearly um, focused on Zionism and fetishization of Judaism as part of maybe a political and largely evangelical Christian viewpoint. It's a viewpoint in which Jews are basically bit players. Rabbi, mm -hmm. what, 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 do you, what do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, I think Jewish organizations like American Jewish Committee, Anti-Defamation League, they spend an inordinate amount of time on conflating anti-Zionism and criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. And it, as Laura said, it muddies, it muddies the waters to the point where we're not able to really focus on where the real danger is coming from. I mean, I also think, from an ideological point of view, I agree with Laura that it's, it's, it, it is illogical, it, it's, and it's morally indefensible. But I think also from a strategic point of view, if we're really trying to address the issues of the rise of anti-Semitism that we've been talking about, uh, it is a diversion. It's diverting attention and resources away from where we need to be focusing. Uh, Larry, you talked about the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and, and their definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, in recent years, countries like Germany and the U.S. have adopted uh, that, that working definition, which says that it is anti-Semitic to, quote, deny the Jewish people their right to self-determination, uh, for example, by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. Uh, you've called this definition uh, explicitly politicized, uh, and you've cautioned, as you mentioned earlier, that it can be easily used to weaponize the fight against anti-Semitism. Uh, in 2020, the U.S. State Department considered labeling three global human rights groups, Amnesty International, <laughs> Human Rights Watch, and Oxfam, as anti-Semitic because of their stances on Israel and Israeli uh, actions in the occupied territories. Uh, what are the potential repercussions of this? So the, the idea of, this, of having this definition, I mean, and I'd encourage people to read about this because the lead drafter on the IRA definition is a guy named Kenneth Stern, and he has publicly basically said this isn't what it was meant to be used for. It was meant to be used for research. It was never meant to be used as an enforced and enforceable um, definition. What we're seeing, though, is obviously this effort to weaponize it and enforce it. And, you know, again, setting aside the question of whether people's in, people have bad intent, I think there's a lot of people who say we need a definition, anti-Semitism rising. You have to define it to fight it. We have hate crimes laws across this country, hate crimes laws that bar um, actions, that bar discrimination, that, that, that punish violence, that is motivated by religious hatred, by ethnic hatred. All of that really does cover anti-Semitism. The effort here, and if, if you take people at their word, if you listen to the people who, were, um, who are most instrumental in, in pushing this definition and trying to get it into law in the U.S., they're explicit. The reason we need this, this, this in law is to quash criticism of Israel. Mm -hmm. We already have laws that prevent people from attacking you because you are Jewish. That's a hate crime. That already exists in law. The value added here is the Israel piece of it. 
and the value added is the, the, the clause that you read, right, which is the, the self-determination. There's another clause in there that talks about not holding Israel to double standards, which I refer to as the all lives matter version of this clause, <laughs> which means you're only allowed to criticize Israel if you're criticizing every other country in the world that is doing similar things. And if you're not criticizing every other country in the world, that proves that you are ipso facto anti-Semitic because you're focusing on Israel's bad behavior. Mm. Uh, last month, mm -hmm. uh, some 400 Jewish settlers marched through the West Bank town of Hawada, uh, burning cars and homes, uh, killing one Palestinian, injuring hundreds mm -hmm. more. Uh, a senior Israeli army military commander referred to this as a pogrom, mm -hmm. uh, a term that historically has referred uh, to the 19th and 20th century anti-Semitic rampages mm -hmm. on Jewish towns in Eastern Europe. Uh, talk to me about the weight that a term like pogrom carries in the Jewish cultural imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and what does it mean to hear it applied in the Palestinian context? Sure. And it's also interesting that an Israeli military official was using absolutely. that word. But, you know, the word pogrom, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 is, a, it is a word that has deep emotional and historical re resonance for, for Jews. Uh, but it's also, it's also a technical term, you know, and it's not owned by Jewish people. It's not historically, it is not historically only applied to Jews. Uh, you know, a pogrom, really technically, when we're talking about a pogrom, it is, it is a massacre uh, that occurs that is in some way instrumentalized by a government, but is carried out by local populations, uh, but is in many ways enabled for government, for political purposes by governments. That's what happened in Tsarist Russia, you know, when, when we saw, you know, peasantry and, and local, locals uh, throughout Eastern Europe Attacking, uh, attacking and killing and maiming Jewish populations, but it was very much because they were carrying out the desires of, of the leaders of Tsarist Russia. You know, the, the reports that we're hearing out of Hurara uh, was that the military, uh, in, in many ways, looked the other way and uh, allowed these settlers to, to run amok throughout the village. Uh, there's numerous reports of this. That's why a military leader could use a word like pogrom, because he understood that. Um, and that he knew that there were real, real problems in the Israeli military uh, and that there are deep relationships between the Israeli military and the settler community. So, I mean, I think when it comes to a word like pogrom, you know, I think there are many in the Jewish community that want to exceptionalize Jewish oppression, that they want to see somehow these words only apply to Jews, that we can't, you know, compare anything throughout history to the oppression of the Jewish people, whether it's in Israel or anywhere else in the world. The IRA definition also includes, by the way, comparing Israel to Nazi Germany, uh, which is, you know, a very slippery kind of argument. You know, it all, but it also exceptionalizes that, that there's nothing that we can compare to, you know, use the, using Nazism to compare to, to the Jewish people. We can't, that's somehow off limits, even though Nazism was state oppression. It was an extreme form of, of uh, state violence against a specific minority, which is not exceptional. It's something that we've seen throughout history, and we need to be able to make these connections if we're going to fight them. I mean, for years we were told you can't use the word apartheid because that shuts down the conversation, people can't hear it. And, you know, for years policing the discourse to try to keep it within the comfort zone of, of Jewish Americans didn't make Jewish Americans any more amenable to taking seriously the concerns of Palestinians and the violations of Palestinian rights. I will say that language has has weight. It matters. Having the word pogrom used here does for certainly for Jewish people everywhere. It evokes something very specific and it's exactly what Rabbi Rosen said. It evokes, you know, state-backed violence, the marauding, the lack of accountability. It's all of that which you saw. Um, I, I think people use it in the context of horror with 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 purposes, with agency. It means something. Rabbi Rosen, in, in 1933, 15 years before uh, the founding of the State of Israel, uh, Germany began revoking citizenship for Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, it, back then, uh, almost every nation refused to take in Jewish refugees, even uh, as the Holocaust was escalating. Mm -hmm. Now let's fast forward to 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, after a shooter killed four uh, Jews in a Paris kosher market, mm -hmm. uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, to all the Jews of France and to all the Jews of Europe, the state of Israel is your home. Mm -hmm. uh, these statements were widely criticized as being politically motivated and simply aimed at boosting European migration to Israel. Uh, but uh, thinking about all these recent attacks, uh, 
what do you say to people who say there is a need for a Jewish state uh, in majority Jewish control uh, as a place precisely for this reason, so that Jews can be protected from the kind of violence that we've been witnessing over the past few years? Well, it's interesting. When Netanyahu made that statement uh, in, in response to what happened in France, he went to France and spoke in a, in a French synagogue. And the French Jews in the synagogue was having none of it. In fact, they stood up and started singing the French national anthem while he was <laughs> urging them to, to flee to Israel. So, you know, I think in the, in the diaspora Jewish community, uh, obviously there is not, has not been a rush to, to emigrate to, to the state of Israel among Jews when these kinds of things happen. I think, look, the, the notion of Israel as a safe haven has been at the core of Zionist ideology, ideology from the very beginning, that the world is incorrigibly anti-Semitic, that Jews are essentially endangered by living in the diaspora, and they need as a, minority. as a minority, and they need a state of their own that will guard their physical safety, their well-being. Well, let's look at what's happened. I mean, is Israel, is Israel a safe place for Jews? I mean, if you look at violence against Jewish people, um, is, Israel is, you know, has become in many ways a kind of a, this, it, its own embattled state that's, that's uh, been focusing its energies almost exclusively on, on trying to protect Jewish lives. And Jews throughout the diaspora have, have not made that exodus to Israel as, as early Zionists were anticipating. So, but that, that wouldn't negate the argument that the formation of a Jewish state with, Jew, mm -hmm. major, with Jewish majority control does provide safety. It depends on what you mean by safety. You know, do, does everybody need, does, does every group of people need a military that, of their own to be able to safeguard their, their well-being? There are other ways to, to achieve security, um, fighting for equal rights in the communities in which you live, uh, making common cause with other peoples who are endangered as well, um, you know, safety and security through solidarity. Um, I think historically you could make a strong, a strong argument that over-militarism only endangers everybody in the end. Um, and Israel is one of the most militarized countries in the, in the world. You know, I mean, you should make no mistake about that. Um, does that make Jews or anyone else safe in the long run? Um, I'm, I would say no, but I think it's definitely something we should be talking about and arguing about. Um, you know, Judaism has always been a diaspora-focused religion. Jews have always lived throughout the diaspora. Uh, and it, the diaspora has been, historically, in, in many instances, unsafe for Jews. There's no question about that. I'm not trying to deny that. The question then becomes, how do we ensure Jewish safety? Is it through nationalism? Is it through ethnic nationalism? In other words, basing a state primarily on the identity of one particular people? And even though there are many people from other groups who happen to historically live in that place, is that, is that a recipe for safety for Jews or anyone else? I think that's a question we should be openly talking about, and I don't think it's anti-Semitic to, uh, to challenge that, that thesis. Can, if I just add, I think it's also important to take a step back. There is rising anti-Semitism in the world. It needs to be contended with, it needs to be recognized, it needs to be fought. Jews are not facing a Nazi genocide everywhere in the world right now, right? Taking seriously the rising anti-Semitism, the threat of anti-Semitism, is not synonymous with Jews everywhere that they live are on the verge of losing their citizenship and finding themselves stateless and homeless without protection. That is, that is a false framing, even if that is a framing that maybe sits deep in the, in, in the core for a lot of Jewish people who think of the history. That isn't where we are today. In, in the United States, Jews are very safe. We are, we are, we are in good position. We, we have strong security organizations. We live in states that have, we live in a country that has rule of law. We have states that have hate crimes laws. We're not, we're not by any means the most vulnerable, the most insecure population. We are among the populations that is most on top of this and in a position to defend ourselves. I just think that this framing of, 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 which, is, which is grounded in like an existential fear for Jews everywhere in the world, is out of step with where we are today. It is possible to take seriously and prioritize fighting anti-Semitism and, the, and the, the trends that are that underlie it without making this about we actually have to make sure that no matter what, there is a place because someday we're all going to have to pack up our bags and flee. It's also, I, I just have to say, it... Jewish safety at the expense of safety of other people is not safety at all. And that's, I think, a fundamental issue with Zionism itself. Rabbi Rosen, uh, Larry Friedman, thank you so much for joining me on up front. Thank you. Okay, everyone, that is our show. 
Upfront, we'll be back next week.